going back, remembering UGA interview. And today, January 31st, 2012, we are talking with Winston Stevens and Joan Zitzelman about their memories from a turbulent time in the university's past. We are visiting in the historic Ray Nicholson House on the University of Georgia campus. Claude McBride, Alice Vernon, and Bill Evelyn, our videographer, all part of the Going Back team are in attendance. I am Fran Lane, and it is my pleasure, Winston and Joan, to welcome you both today to take us back to some tumultuous times, not only in the University of Georgia's history, but also in the history of our country. Uh, uh, let's start, though, get a little perspective. Uh, talk a little bit about yourself, your family, your early education, your growing up years. Will you set that up for us a little bit? Who you, who you were? Would you like to start? I will start. Um, well, I was born in Athens. Uh, my mother was born in Athens. And my father came over here to the university from Atlanta and met my mother and they decided to settle here after World War II. Um, I started school when I was uh, six, this was uh, 47, and I started at uh, Chase Street School and I went on to Athens High School which still had some teachers there that my mother had had when she was she was there. Um, thinking about uh, the issues that we were facing at the university, I reflected that uh, I had no, uh, no, th never had a thought about why there weren't any black children in my class. Uh, th this. It just, it was one of those things where uh, I just, this was the way things were when I got here and, and I, I never thought, I didn't wonder where they went to school or if they went to school. Uh, I don't believe I ever um, had a conversation with an African-American person of my age until I met some of them at the university. I met uh, people's cooks and the people they worked for, but I didn't meet their, their children. So, Well, I didn't start my life in Athens. I started it in Pennsylvania, but my family moved to Athens, my mother, father, and I, I was an only child, in uh, 1948 and I went to Barrow School uh, down near the university campus and then to Athens High School as Winston did and, uh, and it, it was just natural to me to want to come on to the University of Georgia because I decided at the age of 16 that I was going to be a broadcaster and this had a wonderful school of journalism so I just knew I was headed here and then going on at the same time uh, was that in 19... 60, we elected a, a young president and we were interested in all kinds of things that had to do with we felt a changing and growing America and then came in our early years as university students a series of lawsuits to admit African American students to the university. Now at the age of six or seven in New Jersey I had been in an integrated school and somehow that memory uh, wasn't conscious, but I had no qualms about the fact that black and white people could sit in the same room together or, or share a class together or something like that. It just, it just was an unconscious acceptance of that. And so clearly as we approached the, the integration of the University of Georgia, I was quite content that it would be a good thing, that it was the right thing to do, that it was a good thing to do but certainly then became aware that I was living in a community, as Winston has referred to, where really there had been total separation of uh, white people from black people of, of their own kind and their own age. And uh, 
So we had to begin to understand that issue, not only as you might read about it or see it on television, but we had to understand that things were going to happen in this community and on this university that we were going to be a part of and deciding how we were going to be a part of that. And that leads to, to my next question. What was the climate, or talk about the climate in the state and on campus at the time with regard to desegregation? Well, I got here the fall of, of 59 and um, because I had been in the youth group at the Pres First Presbyterian Church, I, my mother and I were both kind of born into the First Presbyterian Church and went to everything that happened there, uh, the Sunday school classes, and then I went to the, to the youth group. And I believe that the, um, the man that led our youth group my senior year in, in uh, high school, Al Kissling, would have told us or made sure that we knew that two students from the um, from Atlanta, Charlene Hunter and Hamilton Holmes, had uh, tried to get admitted to the university in '59, and that they were kept out. Uh, but that was all kind of in the vague background. But there was talk about the whole issue of keeping the university open and people were uh, concerned that whatever happened, uh, because the legislature was saying that they would, or the, there was a law in the books that they would close the university. So there was discussion about that. But otherwise, it was all kind of in the background and, and vague. Um, so I, I expect that year 59 to 60 was pretty much like most of the years that had gone before. Um, I. Um, joined a sorority and that you know, sort of got swept up in that and it it felt to me like the, the sorority and fraternity people were the ones that were running the university and so you you needed to be a part of that and uh, um, you got involved in women's student government also didn't you I did uh, I'm not sure I did that first year. I'm not sure exactly what the timing was on that. But anyway, I did uh, that year I did start going to Westminster Fellowship, like coming out of the youth group at First Church over there just as a matter of course. And I met Bill Rogers, who was the um, head minister there. And <clears throat> I've talked about this, that I don't remember anything that Bill said not, no, no speech or any particular thing stands out. But what I, what I got from being there was this kind of calm, uh, contemplative atmosphere, where we were asked questions about uh, what was going on and, and our attitude toward it. So I'm sure I was asked to consider whether it was right that these two A students from Atlanta uh, were being kept out of the university um, when I knew uh, people who had gone to in class, who were in classes with me at Athens High School who weren't as good as students and they had been accepted. So that kind of thing was brought up for discussion uh, linking it to what does it mean to be a Christian? What does that have to do with not just your your personal conduct of being a kind and good person, but what it would mean for your community? And um, I had a slightly different range of experience coming into this because I wanted to work in news and broadcasting. And so here came a major American news story that was centered in Athens, Georgia and at the University of Georgia. So reading the news magazines, watching what was on television, following newspaper accounts of uh, the court suits that were going on and, and how people that I knew were dealing with it. Some people were, were testifying in court and saying things that one had to have some doubts about. 
and, and knowing that more and more as the situation developed and went through the court process, it was becoming apparent that this university was going to be ordered to desegregate. So now we began to talk in, in the atmosphere. I came into Westminster Fellowship in, in the fall of 1957 or, or in 58. It was a place to just talk about what was going on around us and what our reaction would be and the fact that somehow the faith that we were encountering in church on Sunday had something to do, or, or our beliefs, had something to do with how we were going to behave in this situation. How in a situation where you might not agree with everything that was going on, you did have to acknowledge that no matter what race a person was, if you could meet the qualifications, you had every right to be in the place where, where the rest of us were in the educational world. So the, the opportunity to not only uh, deal with that as an individual, but to think about it in the professional side of how this is perceived in the larger world and what my role might be someday as a journalist was incredibly uh, invigorating, sometimes frightening, but it was, it was something I wanted to explore. It was something I knew that I had to keep reaching out as far as I could to understand how it was going to affect this university and, and this community. So there was a disconnect between those things that you grew up with, Winston, the way the world was, and what you were beginning to hear. Mm -hmm. you, you have an interesting, um, uh, your memoirs, basically we'll call it your memoir that is on the uh, Presbyterian Student Center mm -hmm. website. You mentioned going to court yes, to see the trial. Talk a little bit about that. Yes. Uh, this would be, have been the fall of 1960. Uh, the the uh, Charlene and Hamilton were kept out for still one more quarter, and this was being um, challenged. And so at that point, of course, we were talking all about that at Westminster. So I went to the, to the courtroom when Walter Danner the registrar of the university was going to testify. Uh, he was a deacon at the church and at one time had been my Sunday school teacher. And the first thing that happened was I was kind of bowled over by uh, Mrs. Mobley, who was the attorney for the students, because I didn't know that a woman could be a lawyer much less a black woman. So, you know, she's doing all this. I said, oh, that's really something, you know. <laughs> and the question, it was, as I remember, it was pretty short, but the question that she asked Walter Danner was, have you, in your capacity of registrar, ever denied entrance to the university to students for the sole, uh, the sole reason being that they were not white. And he said, no, that was never the reason. <laughs> I, I, I felt like I've been struck by lightning. He's lying. He's lying on the witness stand. How could he do that? And I remember sitting there thinking, could there possibly be some way that he thinks he's telling the truth? You know, and and um, that that was really a pivotal moment for me because um, I, I just it was just so obvious that uh, this wasn't right and um, an epiphany. Yes. Yeah, so that that's the most vivid memory I have of that particular experience. Um, something that I should have said about my family is that in 1960, when Kennedy became president, my father was elected to be the um, the representative to Congress from this this area. Um, so of course he was very particularly concerned with everything going on legally, although 
uh, I think in a way he was glad to be out of the legislature at that point and into the in Washington. Yes, he, he didn't have to talk about it as much. <laughs> um, and I certainly, um, I his campaign in 1960 where at least one of the candidates was calling himself the white man's candidate. Uh, as, as I went through these experiences and thinking about, is this going to hurt my father, uh, there were some things that I uh, didn't sign or, or didn't get involved with because um, I, I didn't want to do something that, that would be um, detrimental to his getting elected again because I was completely convinced that he was the most liberal person who could have been elected to that job. And we were able to talk some about what was going on. And as, so, Later on I want to ask you all about this awakening perspective on the changes that were moving through society and what it was like to try to communicate with that, our parents' generation. Mm -hmm. um, but. Um, Talk a little bit more, y'all, about the Westminster Fellowship and also about the disciplined community, what, what those two things were. What began to happen is a kind of preparation, or at least because it was a very important issue, desegregation in the South, of having programs where we brought in people like the author Lillian Smith to speak to a group of people, or we went as a group maybe five or six of us down to an African-American based college in Augusta Payne College and suddenly... Talk in detail, John. Yes, that, that was one of my, my strong weekends. About five or six of us went down to Payne College with one or both of the the two ministers from Westminster Fellowship. And that was, was that Bill Rogers? That and, was Bill Rogers and, and Corky, Corky King. King. And and we were greeted on a Friday evening. We walked into a room, and for the first time in my life, there were five or six of us, and there were about 200 people of another race. And it was a physical reaction. It wasn't just an emotional reaction. It was physical. You felt it churning in your stomach. And they were so kind to us and so hospitable and wanted to get to know us. And we were staying in the dormitory, so I was in a room with three African-American girls, one of whom was from Athens, and like Winston's experience, never met someone my age from Athens who was a college student. And, and as we talked about Athens, we didn't know Athens in the same way. I wouldn't have known the neighborhoods they were talked about living in or that, that my, where I uh, lived. Uh, the next day as we had breakfast and we're there through the day for lunch, the kindness of people was beginning to make me ill. You know, yes. it just suddenly hits you that, that when, when the, the coin is reversed and you are treated like a very special and, and decent and honorable human being and you're looking at people who haven't been treated that way for most of their lives in many situations. Uh, Corky, for some reason, had to drive home on Saturday night. We were supposed to stay over Saturday night, and I asked him if I could just come home and recover from that. <laughs> and, uh, so he drove me back to my house. I then had to walk into my house where my parents had company, and I had to, as quietly as I could, just excuse myself and go to my room and just sit there and, and cope with it. So some of the opportunities they opened up for us there. I, I think, as Winston says, there was no preaching at us about what values we should hold. There was just opening up a number of windows where we could go and explore and then determine how we felt about it and what, what we were going to be called upon to do in our own behavior, as setting our own values and how that reflected our faith and, and what we were going to do situation to situation. So their influence on us and, and as a group of people discussing things very openly, as, as you're saying, uh, it was so different from, from out in the community at large where these things were not spoken of or if they were there was a tradition of how they were spoken of so you didn't get down to what was you were deeply feeling. 
Was Lillian Smith the author of Strange Fruit? Was yes, that what Strange yeah, Fruit so and talk Killers a, of the Dream. Talk a minute about uh, well, her. Well, those books that she wrote were about a, um, Strange Fruit. If, if people don't remember what the title of Strange Fruit or, or what that actual phrase means, she was talking about the fact that in the South, the strange fruit you sometimes saw on a tree was a lynched African American. And, and her books were controversial, and to some extent she had been ostracized because she stayed in Georgia, and she'd moved up to a mountaintop up in the, in the Georgia mountains. Um, and she was not in great health, but to be invited to come down to the university and meet with students, she made the effort to do that. And again, our programs were not just for, for students of Presbyterian or any particular denomination. If people wanted to come and listen, and she was quite well known, so we had quite a group of students who wanted to hear her, and it was an ordeal for her. But she came, as many people did, to speak to students who were questioning the old values and to encourage you to, to form your own value judgments and to act on them. And, and her, her appearance here certainly had something to do with that. Um, we also went to Atlanta at one point to meet with Jean Patterson, who was the editor of the Atlanta Constitution at that point. But the publisher was Ralph McGill, who had won a, a Pulitzer Prize for writing some editorials about the situation here in Georgia. And after we'd met with Jean Patterson, it was a lovely opportunity. He then walked us down the hall to meet Ralph McGill. Well, you know, it's like meeting one of your journalistic heroes, and there he was over his typewriter working on something. And so to the, again, the windows that were open to, to begin to explore and to decide what was important in life, I think the journey we were making, we knew that we were going to continue to make. I, I, some of it had to be quiet, not spoken of to everyone around us, but, but the journey was taking on a force of its own at that point, I think. I was going to say it, you know, so often and for so many years people spoke of the college campus as being the sort of the, the ivy colored covered walls yes. and that mm -hmm. only those things that happened internally were the things that mattered to those people who were there. And here there was this issue, this bright red issue that was uh, in, in the intruding or, or, or maybe breaking down some of those walls. T uh, on campus were your friends, and I realized that the Westminster Fellowship was maybe a special group and where a place, Joan, yeah, I think, where you felt friendly. safe yes, and you, you could, could be candid yeah, in your thinking and about your concerns. What about the, the cam campus-wide? Well, I had uh, one of my friends from high school, uh, this is jumping ahead a little bit, but she um, she was one person that on the day that Charlene Hunter and Hamilton Holmes arrived, she went up to them and, uh, and gave Charlene a, Charlene a note welcoming her to campus. So there were, you know, individuals like that. Uh, and there were certainly some girls in, the, in my sorority that um, I felt in tune with, and we, we talked about those things, uh, a couple of whom came to this reunion that we had. Um, but I definitely was, um, I, I guess this is probably my way of doing things anyway, but definitely I would, I'd listen for a while for people talking before I would start talking about what was going on uh, to, to know if I felt safe. Um, uh, socially safe, I mean, about uh, talking up much about my where I stood. Um, well, I tell you, we're going to we're going to talk in a minute about what happened on the first day, yes. and then what happened a little bit later. So, and and we'll maybe come back to that, Winston, if that's okay. Talk about the days leading up to the admission of of. Uh, Charlene Hunter and Hamilton Holmes to the university because after the court ruling uh, in January of 61, they were admitted to the university. Talk a little bit about that. That's correct. And actually, we did meet before we came to just, 
look at some facts because sometimes your recollections aren't as sharp as you wish they were. So one of the things that came out of what we've just looked at was helpful to me in that uh, on Monday, which I think was January 9th, was the day they were ordered admitted. They came over to Athens, but there was also a stay of the ruling and then an overturn of the stay. And so they went back to Atlanta that, that same day. They, and they were in Atlanta Tuesday, but came over briefly. But they did not attend classes on, on Monday or Tuesday of that week. And my recollection was, I was in the College of Journalism, Charlene was registered in the College of Journalism, and on Wednesday morning, uh, she was to be in our class. And again, just moments that happen that we've been talking about where suddenly you have to make a decision. I walked into a classroom that was a raked theater going up, an amphitheater, in which we were seated alphabetically and I was on the top of the last row as Zitzelman. And I walked into the class and went up to my seat and then I looked down where the, the lectern was and behind was a big blackboard and someone had written on that blackboard an epithet that was I thought was unacceptable to be in our classroom. And so I got up from my seat and I walked all the way down the stairs and up to the blackboard and I erased what was on the blackboard. And then I turned around looking at probably about 75 students in this class and I wondered who had written it and I wondered if that person was going to try to come and write it again. But I walked back up to my seat and before anything else happened, Dean Drury, the Dean of the Journalism School, walked into the classroom with Charlene Hunter Galt with Charlene Hunter at his side and uh, a classmate of mine, Marsha Powell, who was actually writing about this story for the Red and Black, the three of them walked into the classroom together. Now, Marsha and Charlene sat down on the front row to the side and not anywhere with it, with near the other students. And the, the dean went on and taught his class for that hour. And so after it was over, uh, everyone dispersed. Uh, and as uh, most people know who've read the history, it was the Wednesday night when she was at the dormitory uh, at Myers Hall at the top of Lumpkin Hill. There was a basketball game that night between Georgia and Georgia Tech at the Coliseum, uh, which was then at the bottom. Stegman Coliseum was then at the bottom of the hill where the entrance is now to the, to the football stadium. And students, many students, had tried to call the university uh, administrators that they knew and suggested that that game be postponed or moved to the Georgia Tech campus and that had not been done. Georgia lost that game by a few points and after that game was over people started walking up the hill towards Central Myers Hall and that's where the one really bad night we had here in Athens developed of students, you know, there was the crowd together, some people wanted to arouse that crowd uh, some people had thought it was uh, a bit of a lark to watch a large crowd making a protest and um, it developed into a situation where um, the local police did come, no one else came even though they were asked to come, the state patrol and others. Um, and finally the resolution was that the two students, the African American students, were suspended for their own safety and removed from the campus and at that point the, um, the situation uh, of the mob group around Myers Hall when they knew she was, uh, Charlene was no longer there, it dispersed pretty quickly. Um, but one of the reasons we wanted to do this interview on behalf of the university and our love for it is we, would, we wanted people to know that there were students here of all kinds of opinions and that to see something like that happen on your campus the reaction to that the next day on this campus and in this town was that that would never ever happen again and it never did. So again that was a kind of a tense and difficult time for many people but I think it showed that there, there's a special heart to this university and this community that can come together no matter how painful it seems it's going to be at the time. Sorry, I didn't mean to make a speech, but I, I, I still feel that well, so strongly. Yes. <laughs> we can make a speech. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs>
I always heard that Dean Tate was an important oh, person. Oh, he was. Uh, I was not there. We, we'd made a decision of those of us who kind of suspected what might happen. If you had a role to play, if you were a student government officer or you were president of a, of a group, you would, you would go and try to keep the group calm if such a thing developed. But those of us who had no role to play would not go, so I was not there. But I have just heard and read accounts of, uh, and, and even on television, Dean Tate walked through that crowd and wherever he saw a st someone he suspected was a student, he confiscated their ID card so he could get to them the next day and give some appropriate discipline for having done that. But uh, no one, as far as we know, was, was injured uh, seriously. Some bricks went through windows, uh, broke windows, and people were hurt by glass. But no one was physically beaten in any way. No one was, was seriously injured. But still, to have that happen and to see the next day on the national newscast on NBC and ABC, mm -hmm. to see film of, a, of your town being called the scene of a riot, the, the reaction on the campus and in this community was, was just so painful. And, and people never wanted to see that happen again. Take, take your breath away. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yes. Yes. Uh, like other members of my family, I never throw a piece of paper away, so I have all these. Uh, I have a number of documents that are things that, um, like the there was a group that met at the Westminster House that called themselves the Students for Constructive Action. And so after the riot, they sent a telegram to the to the um, capital about to the governor about you know this and and various faculty members and faculty groups talked about it. In you know thinking about what you said, uh, given that nobody was hurt in that riot, it turned out to be good in that it really mobilized all the people who never wanted that to happen right. again. That's true. And to, well, listen, having them sitting in classes is, we'll, we'll just, you know, we'll have it. We'll, you know, we can make it work. And uh, the one thing, uh, I, I was keeping a diary during this time and um, now I think, why didn't I put in more details that I was interested in? You know, stop talking about how much homework I had. Uh, and that boy I was interested in, you know. But uh, one thing I wrote is that um, the, it, was on, it was on television, the scene of, of Charlene and um, Hamilton being put in the car and taken away, and Charlene was crying. And so later that day I was, I was at home with my parents and my younger sister who was only 10 was asking me, why was she crying? And I wrote in my diary, and it was just pitiful trying to explain it to her, <laughs> you know, it was just really, I didn't know what to say. Um, but uh, I, I wrote that I got a glimpse of them during the, the, the when they um, registered, and then of course I heard that my friend had given her a note. But other than that, not much happened for me during that time except, except reading the, the papers and watching TV like everybody else. Well, what did happen for me, of course, as I said, Charlene was registered in a class I was taking. And it took them two days going back to court to be ordered to be readmitted to the university. So by the next Monday, which I believe, if I'm counting right, is about the 16th of January, <coughs> they came back to the campus and Charlene was then in my class. Well, as I told you, Dean Drury had seated us alphabetically and we were all in the central portion of this class and Charlene was sitting all by herself down below and he came in to the next class and said, well, I'm not going to require that you sit alphabetically anymore. <coughs> and so the next day I went down and sat with my sorority sister and with Charlene and was introduced to her. And from then on we began to build a friendship. 
when you need water, sir. A courageous person at age 19, 20. Well, we were studying the same things. We were interested in the same things. I mean, it was easy to build an acquaintance because we watched the same television news. We watched, we admired the same commentators. We admired the same writers. And we were sharing a class, so we had all these things to talk about, as any student does in any class you're taking. So it was a very easy, you know, there was, it, to me it wasn't hugely courageous to do that at all. I, you feel invulnerable at that age, you know. We were remembering back. You don't think anybody's going to come at you. You, you think you're going to be okay. Pretty co you were courageous, but really pretty cocky, huh? Okay with that. <laughs> you know, most of my friends were okay with that. I, did, I really didn't get much uh, problem with my, my own personal friends, the Westminster friends, and I was involved in the drama department. And they all thought this was kind of cool, actually. <laughs> but uh, it, it was just a natural kind of thing. When you, just as you build a friendship with anyone, when you like to do the same things. Now, the thing that I, I am now embarrassed about after reading her own book of her recollections there when you talk about this disconnect you get, I was, the, the campus was open to the African American students. Only to them, but it was open to them. But they could not go into Athens and go to the movies. They could not go into Athens and eat at a restaurant. And I have to confess that I simply didn't observe that with any, with any sensitivity. I didn't, I didn't realize that. I, she and I often had lunch together at the Georgia Center or uh, in one of the campus dining halls, but then I went home. I was living at home, so I, I then I went home and then went out and did other things. And when she mentioned that, it suddenly struck me that I could have at least said something or talk, tried to talk to her about that, <laughs> and I didn't. You know, we, we dealt with the things we dealt with as a friendship, but, but there were still many, many veils drawn over the life that was here. And part of that was that we, it just was not in our... Right. Well, I mean, we'd grown up from childhood and just not seeing it, not, not noticing it. Talk a little bit more about... We talked about national news and reporters. What was the media's involvement? I, I, I remember seeing pictures of it seemed like more media people than there were students on campus. They were just all over everywhere. Were they... Uh, reporting accurately or were they part of some of the, the tension and the, and the uh, uh, reaction, response maybe from students? Did, ha did you have any feelings about that? I know I didn't, I didn't experience, I had no experience of that so you know I heard like rumors that maybe some of the reporters were trying to drum up uh, some yells, you know, uh, some some kind of demonstration for their cameras, but I, I never I knew anything about that firsthand. Or. I, n I never observed it personally because, again, I tried to stay away from where the crowds were. It's, it's an interesting thing, and of course it's a lifelong habit of mine anyway. If everybody goes rushing off to see the accident and all the bodies lying down there, <laughs> I go the other way. Um, and so I, I really didn't, but now I was watching the news constantly. And so there were people I had always admired who told, I thought, the full truth. Ray Moore, who was the director of WSB TV News in those days, he had done some very sensitive documentaries leading up to this situation. And he was uh, very carefully reporting what was going on as accurately as possible, in my opinion. I, I had liked uh, Ralph McGill's writing. Jean Patterson, the editor of the Atlanta Constitution, I thought we're doing a very substantive job of reporting. Time Magazine, Newsweek Magazine, I thought we're doing a very substantive job of reporting. But when you talk about the media attention, and this would be very common to situations today, um, after the students came back the following Monday and there were no more demonstrations in town, they were gone in a few days. You know, there was nothing to report. There, there were no fireworks at night. There were no bricks through windows. And how often can someone just stand there and shout at the camera, I don't, I don't want these people here when you know darn good and well they're going to be here. <laughs> uh, you know, the story, 
And that still happens today, can evaporate in 24 hours. And once it was apparent that this community and this university were going to move on, that's what happened, and the media went away. John, there were some other visits that you talked about, uh, a visit by students from Ohio University, uh, 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 your visit with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Mm -hmm. uh, and Winston, you talked about visiting Ebenezer Baptist and meeting Martin Luther, Martin Luther King Jr. Can I ask you all to talk about those events sure. briefly? Uh, that's fine. Uh, let me think back to the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, um, however that was set up. Again, you know, sometimes someone just says, oh, would you like to go over and meet these folks? And we'd say, oh, sure. And then a week or so later, we'd get in a car and <laughs> we'd drive over. Uh, that, that group was at um, Pascal's Restaurant out near the, the uh, Atlanta University area of, uh, of uh, Atlanta where the, where the six black campuses are. And my first time to visit Pascal's, and uh, I know Lonnie King was there. I, I don't remember all the people who were there that day. But, uh, he, I think, was the actual named leader of that group at that time, and uh, just talked about what they were trying to accomplish there in Atlanta. It was the time of sit-ins. There were other things going on besides desegregating universities, and there had been sit-ins at Atlanta restaurants. There had been sit-ins uh, in, in North Carolina and so on, and this group was more than one state-based. They they would go to different communities where they felt there were there were people who wanted some assistance in in how to do a peaceful protest of of one kind or another. So meeting other people involved was helpful. The students from Ohio University who came down. I my recollection is we actually met over at Westminster house, but I may be wrong about that, had been watching the national news, and so their perception of Southerners was not terribly fa uh, favorable after watching what had happened, where, where, you know, the buses that came in that were trying to desegregate um, transportation facilities, the, the uh, ride-ins, what was it called? Oh, yeah. Boy, talk about memory <laughs> letting you down, uh, but, but they they needed to, to be able to talk with somebody back and forth about how things were going on and what different perceptions were. So uh, it was a good opportunity for us to, to know how other people were perceiving a situation and, and then be able to counteract it if indeed there, there, was, there were things people needed to know to get the full story. Okay. Uh, I've forgotten what you were... Ebenezer. Oh, yes. Ebenezer Baptist. Uh, I don't even remember exactly when this was, but we went, uh, we went up to Ebenezer Baptist Church and heard Martin Luther King speak. And then afterwards, uh, the way I remember it, is we, it was just our group at, at the end, uh, we got to go, I guess, back of the, a little back of the church and met him and got to shake his hand, um, which, I really like telling people. <laughs> yeah. I would tell my kindergartners when I was teaching kindergarten. You know, we'd always celebrate the the holiday, and they never heard of the guy. But, um, but, uh, and the summer of 1961. Um, a fellow student and I from here, I think through the Religion in Life uh, organization on campus, um, we went to a leadership school in uh, Berkeley, California, and that really put me in touch with people around the country and gave them a chance to talk to us. These are all mostly people who were involved in student YMCA's uh, on uh, campuses all across the country. And there were African American students there and also um, uh, some foreign students who were part of that too. So that kind of, um, made that, that made me feel in touch with, with people around the country. And, 
Of course, they were very interested in what we were dealing with. So you all really had an awakening. Winston, maybe you a little bit more than Joan because Joan's background somewhat had, mm -hmm. had seen this. How did you communicate with your parents or with, with members of their generation in terms of talking about the changes that are coming about in society? How, how, how did this work for mm -hmm. you all? <laughs> well, I remember really wanting to talk to my father about, you know, at various times about the situation. Uh, and of course, uh, after a while he got into a position where he was called upon to vote for or against the civil rights legislation for the country. And uh, in my diary, I wrote about one time when I was really mad at him, uh, and I wrote him this, this letter about how he couldn't tell me what to do anymore, and here I was, uh, uh, you know, maybe going in different directions, but that wasn't his business anymore and all that. And Of course, he was still paying for my college <laughs> education, but I sort of ignored that at the time. And, uh, plus, uh, you know, I did have respect for him, even though he didn't think the same way I did on all, all this. And, and part of the time, I know he was concerned for my welfare. Uh, and Didn't he want you in the middle of something that's that might, right. he might get That's hurt. right. And um, so in my diary, I mentioned that I, I wrote this letter that I, you know, couple of pages all about how I uh, didn't like this that he did and that that he said and everything. And, and then uh, a couple of days later I thought, oh thank God I, I didn't send Daddy that letter because <laughs> it was so mean. <laughs> um, so, uh, of course, uh, I'm thinking too that it helped that he was gone. They were gone to Washington, you know, in 61. He was, uh, part of the time, he was, he was not, uh, they were not living here, you know, they were, they were away. And that, that really helped in terms of uh, the day-to-day kind of, you know, what do you say and what do you do. Um, but I, I did, um, finally was able to um, feel like that that he and I could communicate and that we were, we were not that far apart in, in what we thought. Uh, I think he, he came, I, I think that he, he was concerned about all, all the, the things that come up when you take the people who have been separate and you put them together, naturally. Uh, I don't think he thought it was a good idea to keep them out of the university, even though he couldn't say that straight out. But I think that he, uh, he knew what, uh, what was really, I mean, Part of him would have the same reaction to hearing Walter Danner say, tell a lie on the stand that I did. <laughs> and he just had to, you know, sort I was going to say, around. would he have known what was going on in Atlanta? Because I think Governor Vandiver, Ernest Vandiver at the time, made a, a decision that we were not going to, the yes. state was not going to close the uh -huh. university. I understand that Carl Sanders had a lot to do with that. Was was the person who, who was... I don't know the politics of that at all, how, how it happened. I mean, we've heard the stories, but we don't really know what really influenced that. Again, w one thing that happened in the whole state of Georgia was so many students here were Georgia residents, and their families were back in all of these legislative districts that had supported passing a law to close the university. On the other hand, when your own a son or daughter is faced with not getting a degree that year or the next year because of something like that and it affected the whole state of Georgia. 
people got very quiet about mm -hmm. that. And so, and that's happened in other situations coming forward into the current political climate. And so that is a great part of what happened was that it was a, an understanding at last that to close this university means that thousands of young people who are pursuing an education aren't going to get a degree, are going to be tarnished somehow in how they live their lives ever after because of that situation that no, that was too high a price to pay. Mm -hmm. And we might not say a great deal about it, but you know, there was that undercurrent that nothing bad was going to happen to Governor Vandiver for not obeying that law. And nothing bad did happen to him <laughs> for not obeying that law. I had a very different family situation. I was living at home with my parents. Otherwise, I probably couldn't have afforded to go to college. It's only the three of us in the house. For years, I had tended to say exactly what I thought or what I was thinking or who my friends were. There, you know, it wasn't a very secretive situation. So in the words uh, I was speaking to my parents about supporting desegregating the university and, and so on, I, I was probably pretty outspoken. I didn't realize that my mother was very fearful about that. I didn't realize it for a while. Uh, my father, I think, could have understood and dealt with this just just in a, a, a general way, but she was becoming very fearful. And at one point, as a surprise to me, she invited Bill Rogers, the Presbyterian minister, to come over to the house to have a discussion. She believed that I was being brainwashed mm -hmm. to, to be spouting these things. She asked him to come over to the house to have a discussion uh, with, with uh, you know, myself, my parents, about proper respect for my parents. And as Winston is saying, suddenly you're made aware that you're living at home and your, your education is being paid for <laughs> and, uh, and, and there's this friction. And so I was deeply embarrassed by that. And after that, I stopped talking at home. And so from you that... You kept going to the Westminster. Oh, I did. I, you know, I did keep going. I, I, and I had my classes and I was building my friendship. But I never spoke, spoke of that anymore at home. And uh, I did not actually speak of it. My mother died in 1970 and then, of course, out of school doing a different life. In 1988, when I came back to the university for the, uh, to hear Charlene speak uh, uh, at the graduation ceremony, that afternoon um, I went back home having had lunch and visited with people who were here at that time. And I, my father and I were getting ready to drive up to the mountains together and I was able to tell him the whole story. And as I knew, because of the life he had lived, that was fine with him. But I was so glad to be able to tell him, finally, that there was a friendship, that there was a continuing relationship, and that the values I had had really come from him. You know, you get down to that, mm -hmm. what Winston is, is saying, too. When it came time for him to hire African Americans in the business he had here in Athens, he did that, and he treated them as he, he, as he treated everyone else. Uh, those values were deeply ingrained in him and they, and they get translated to the child. Um, but sometimes I, I just couldn't speak of it to him for a very long time afterward. So I'm glad I had that opportunity. Uh, my mother, I'm afraid, would have never been able truly to understand it or be comfortable with it. What a blessing to have that time with him. Mm, it was. Winston, talk about we, we talked about the media a little while back, but uh, speaking of, of uh, your wa awakening perspective and, and, and letting people in your parents' generation know, talk about Calvin Trillin and what that experience was. Oh. Or, or tell, tell, tell us who he was and then talk a little bit about that experience. Uh, well, he was a journalist and he was writing an article for the New Yorker about everything that happened in Athens and then later it was a book um, and he asked to interview me and I knew I, I was pretty sure that the only reason I was asked to be interviewed is because of my father's position uh, because even though I was in this group, that group, and I spoke freely, uh, 
And, and some people thought that I was walking Charlene Hunter around the campus, but I don't know, know uh, where exactly that came from, uh, that I, I hadn't really done anything to, you know, to stand out as far as this situation was concerned. And um, so we just met, I think, uh, somewhere where we had lunch and, and I just described what I had experienced and the groups I'd been in and so on. And uh, then I, I was spending the summer with my parents in Washington and I got this phone call from the New Yorker Make, they wanted to make sure that my name was spelled correctly or something like that. Uh, oh, uh, I forgot to say that I said, well, you know, because of my father's position, I really don't want to be quoted. He says, oh, no, you won't be quoted. And so so <laughs> they called me up to New York and say, but he said I wouldn't be quoted. You know, they, God, the reporter says you're not going to be quoted. You're kidding. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, I, I was concerned about this um, because of um, this being published and then everybody would know that, that Robert G. Stevens' daughter was uh, consorting with the enemy sort of thing. Um, but it turned out not that many people around here read the New Yorker. <laughs> these cousins of ours, uh, cousins of my father's up in uh, near Washington and seeing the New Yorker on their table and thinking, uh-oh, you know, they're, they're probably upset about this. But it turned out that that cousin was very much in favor of the integration of the university and so that turned out all right. <laughs> Some of the things that we let... Us become clutched. Yes. Mm -hmm. And some of those things that we don't get clutched over, there's yeah. a difference there. So. <laughs> <I know. laughs> Talk about, again, I think we talked about this initially, but what was the disciplined community? Was it a project or a program within the Westminster again, Foundation? That uh, my memory is not as sharp as I wish it were at this point, but um, of the kinds of religious uh, books and, and uh, 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 theories that we were talking about at Westminster was um, a lot of Paul Tillich, the shaking of foundations, and again, I, I honestly don't remember the details so much as the, the idea was that a congregation or a group of people meeting together had a kind of discipline and responsibility to each other, to look after each other, to act, um, uh, you know, to testify within themselves as to what they believed and what they were. And so at this time, at this same time that the desegregation was happening and we were, we were really talking together as a community to do something specific, once that began to ease up after January 16th, uh, to, uh, 1961, we talked about what the next step might be for us to keep exploring issues together, to keep, to, to keep some kind of continuity together. And so the idea became that um, uh, of those people who wanted to be identified this way and to, to make this effort, that every morning, I believe it was about 7.15, that we would gather at Westminster House and have a short devotional program and that it would rotate among each of us, that the, it wasn't a minister as preaching to a congregation, it was each of us responsible for each other, that you would prepare some kind of, of thought for the day or something you wanted to say and it rotated, but if everyone didn't come, you just sat quietly for 15 minutes and you went home and had your breakfast. And of my recollection of doing this for maybe six months, I would say about a third of the time we didn't have a program. You know, here, here you, you know, prepared something, really wanted to share with everyone. We'd all gather and you would do that. But that, that's my recollection of what the disciplined community 
was an, an effort to simply understand that a group can gather together to think together, to, to pray together, to uh, explore and question and even doubt together and that you were doing that. And, and Winston's experience may have been different from mine. So, Well, I also experienced coming together and then not having our program because <laughs> somebody uh, would often oversleep or, or whatever. Um, but uh, one of the things that meant a lot to me was that some of my sorority sisters were interested in being a part of this and they had not been a part of the Westminster Fellowship as such, but it was, it was an intellectual commitment and a, and a community commitment. And those two things uh, together, fe it felt like such a, um, like that's what the university should be. You know, you're really exploring the ideas and you're also um, uh, seeing what in your community, where people need support in your community and you're there to offer it. So part of just meeting every morning, uh, even when we didn't get to hear our lesson or whatever, was it was like, you know, mainly you just show up. <laughs> you know, you, you, uh, you're there and um, uh, you, you just, as a matter of course, you know, you're chatting and you find out concerns that other people in the group have and, or um, problems that have come up that in some area of the university that you might have an idea about. And uh, I really, it was Corky King who really uh, put that together and got us started doing that. Mm -hmm. And then I'd like to mention the third minister who came in my senior year, uh, 263, Roland Perdue, for keeping that going and also for the wonderful welcome he gave. There were four um, African-American students that year and uh, they really found a haven at Westminster Fellowship and I felt that um, that was, you know, really after all the hoopla was over. You know, nobody, nobody around the country knew Harold Black's name or uh, but uh, it, this was when it had really happened. You know, they were here and they were, they were part of the fabric of the, the uh, university and it was ongoing, so. And uh, it's not quite on the subject of what you asked, but I would like to tell you a Mary Frances Early story. Mm -hmm. She came in the summer of 1961 and we were all away. We, you know, summer, we, we were away from Athens doing something else. We did not know what was taking place here when she had her first session of summer school. And it turns out that Corky King and his wife began inviting her over to their home for dinner from time to time. And after making that connection, they discovered that during the time she was here that year, her birthday came up. And so they gave her a birthday party. And she still remembers that. Mm. It was important to her. She talks about that. And, um, and, but we didn't know that, and he never told us he'd done it. I mean, we only learned it this year because Mary Frances told the story, not because Corky ever did. But just those, those quiet things, I, you know, what made the, uh, Bill Rogers and Corky and Roland such admirable human beings is they did a great deal more than they ever talked about of themselves. And and they were never trying to impose any of their ideas on us so much as allow us to come out of our shells and go as far as we wish to go. And they found many ways to do that. The discipline um, uh, mm -hmm. community is one, but another is that in my, um, I think, junior and senior years, during spring break, they organized a trip to New York where we could stay in a uh, I think, I'm not sure it was Presbyterian, but it was one of the denominations, a hostel on 29th Street, and we could, you know, 
go to plays, contemporary plays, and see what the bigger world was all about in New York. But we were chaperoned, you know, we were we were looked after, and we were in a nice, nice, safe environment. But for most of us, it was our first chance to see a Broadway play or to go to a, a major museum. Just it just was opening new windows. So that's one of the reasons we valued that experience so much. And we would say that that should be what college life is about, yes. but it certainly was for well, you all. Well, sometimes it is, and I think it still can be. I, what's amazing to me about a university, because I, I try to maintain a relationship with this one, is that for those who are looking for those kinds of experiences, they do still happen. There are, there are ways. There are many more field trips to go out and experiment with things and hands-on and to, to learn about it. Um, and we're, we're delighted that the Presbyterian Student Center is still there and they're still dealing with these, you know, with, with the issues that are contemporary to this campus now. And an open way to discuss, to, to question, to, uh, and, and to learn new things. Both of you then finished school and took off. <laughs> yeah. Did that have... Certainly, your experiences at the University of Georgia had something to do. Winston, you went to Illinois first, but then right. to California. Mm -hmm. Joan, you headed to New York, New York City. You New headed York to City. New York City. Yes, I did. Um, was that because you had grown strong and and interested and and were ready to to fly away for a while? What t talk about that? I, just I think that's part of it, certainly, and. Uh, uh, I, I wanted a career in broadcasting and I thought that was the place to go to do it. Well, I, I was fortunate enough to find work at the local public television station finally, but not the professional level I might have liked. But it happened that that's where Charlene Hunter was, so I saw her from time to time up there. So I, did, I was able to keep our friendship going a bit. And she was working for first the New Yorker and then the New York Times. So that was as close as I got to visiting the New Yorker and the New York <laughs> Times. Um, but I stayed three and a half years and came back then to Atlanta and uh, was able to work in television broadcasting there and, and then generally have what I would consider an interesting life. But after I moved back to Georgia, I was also, because my father was here, able to keep a relationship with the university and, and with the community. That's been important in my life as well. And I really chose to come back here as I got toward the end of my professional life because this is where I knew I wanted to be. And I still enjoy being related to the university. We're glad you do. Thank you. <laughs> I love it. And I started out, I was going to get my Ph.D. in English and teach in college, and I w went on to instead teach kindergarten, which turned out to be my proper career. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, those, that's a, you need to give folks a good start, and that's what it sounded like <laughs> That's right. right. Let's ask these folks if, if there are questions that you all had during the course of this. Remind me again who your father was. He obviously, he was a representative. Right. Robert Greer Stevens, Jr., and he was the representative from this area from the uh, six, district, right? 10th District, uh -huh, from 61 to 76. Would, do you all think of anything else that we may have not touched on that we... Well, I think I'm, I'm very happy that the university has absorbed um, the whole continuum of what's happened since, mm -hmm. since the desegregation here. And that we did have a 25th anniversary commemoration of that, and Charlene Hunter Galt came back and gave her own assessment of how far we've come, but she always, when she's here, um, and, and, and I try to attend every program she does when she does come here, is she still talks about the task ahead and her influence on the College of Journalism the same way. She's, she's very committed at this point to uh, a situation that we all feel about with the media now. It's become so distracted and often so strident and, and angry that we need a civil um, exchange of ideas in the media. So her influence on the, on the College of Journalism coming to speak as often as she does 
and now she's on the Peabody Awards board, and that will bring her back, I think, I'm not sure how long her term is, last year, this, 2011 was her first year, but the, to keep the relationship here of, of what she has tried to do, and Hamilton Holmes also, the legacy he left, he remained connected to the university, his son attended the university, he served on the athletic board. The board of trustees. Yeah, the, the, the legacy that they have left um, to build a stronger university in this state, I, I just think is a remarkable and good thing. And I'm glad to do whatever small part I can do to, to uh, acknowledge that and to, to keep it going because it's been good for all of us. Right. We thank you all. We appreciate so much your sharing your, your memories today, and, and they're going to be a wonderful addition to our going back, remembering UGA archives, and we appreciate it so much. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Enjoyed it very much.